We left last week in the most dramatic of circumstances. After successfully getting the Governor General to call a double dissolution, Joseph Cook went head to head against Labor's Andrew Fisher in the 1914 election. But in between the election being called and then held, World War I had broken out. Both Cook and Fisher lobbied hard in supporting Mother Britain in the war, making bold promises of tens of thousands of soldiers. When the election came round in September, to the nation's surprise, Fisher won and returned to office for the third time. With stalemate on the western and eastern fronts, a bold plan was hatched. Australian soldiers would enter Turkey through the Dardanelles, storm the beaches and then open up a supply route to Russia via the Black Sea. On April the 25th, 1915, the Anzacs faced their baptism of fire and stormed the beaches of Gallipoli. There was just one slight problem about this plan though. Prime Minister Fisher had no idea about it. Yes, no joke, British High Command did not inform our own Prime Minister of the Gallipoli landings until after they happened. And what is also no joke is that we're now on Patreon. For just one can of roll a month, you can invest in getting us towards the podcast, and if you're keen to give more, you can get all sorts of benefits, including a video on your choice of topic. The subscriber question will come later on with a special guest might I add, so make sure to stick around for it, and as always, you can help the channel for free by liking and subscribing. Now, if you're a long-term viewer of the channel, you'd know that my political history is much better than my military history, so today will primarily be about the home front of Australia. If you want to learn about the battles of World War I themselves, there's plenty of great channels for that. So Andrew Fisher deserves some credit for keeping peace between Liberal and Labor during the war, but his third and final stint as Prime Minister would end in October of 1915, when he resigned unexpectedly. And so this is actually cause for a bit of historical conspiracy. Fisher had twice defeated Billy Hughes for leadership of the party, and so the conspiracy theory goes that Billy Hughes actually secretly knifed Fisher behind closed doors, but let him resign to save face. While this would explain the sudden departure, I think the better explanation isn't quite as exciting. Fisher probably resigned due to health reasons because after he left office, he experienced some pretty sudden senile decline. Hey everyone, I'm Jill Biden's husband. And he was largely frustrated by being left out of British war conversations. It's also worth noting that Fisher had a pretty cushy job as High Commissioner to the UK set up for him, and so Billy Hughes became the next leader, completely uncontested. And Hughes's first act as leader was to head to Britain in 1916 to try and get Australia a bigger seat at the Imperial table. For context, a month after Britain became involved in the Great War, Australia and New Zealand took New Guinea off of Germany in September 1914. At the same time, Japan had taken German colonies north of the equator like Micronesia, and Australia was concerned. Britain had already ignored Deakin's expression of concern about a strong Japanese presence in the Pacific, and they gave Hughes the same treatment. What was worse for Hughes was that the White Australia policy was a strong point of tension. Britain's often remembered as the racist colonial force, but it was actually because of its colonies that Britain strongly opposed White Australia. Not to mention that their alliance with Japan gave them further reason to oppose Australia's exclusively European-based immigration. However, as the conversations went on, he started to find success with Britain's Prime Minister Herbert Asquith, who agreed to consult him more moving forward. After his meeting in London, Hughes then went behind the front line in France, making him really popular amongst the soldiers, who endearingly called him the Little Digger. But in the first half of 1916, the Western Front would endure the horror of the Verdun campaign, when German soldiers launched a major offensive to try and break the stalemate. To relieve the French of defending Verdun, the British launched their own counter-offensive, the Somme campaign. After bombing German trenches with heavy artillery, the British, and so by extension Australia, were hoping to break through the German trench line and press on eastwards. However, the artillery failed to destroy German barbed wire, and there were 58,000 casualties on day one alone. With thousands of Australian deaths, Hugh started to doubt the effectiveness of voluntary recruitment, and started to toy with the idea of following Britain's lead, and introducing conscription. Okay, so as Hughes returned home seeking to enforce conscription, he knew he couldn't go through Parliament. Labor definitely wouldn't support conscription, as the working classes feared being replaced with foreign labor, and the agricultural industry couldn't afford to lose any more workers. Instead, he was forced to go through another channel, a plebiscite. And to explain how that actually worked, we're going to jump over to someone whose whole channel is devoted to making Australian politics simple, Knights in Shining Llama. Thanks, Healthy Harold. Before we get into the conscription votes themselves, 
let's clarify something. Plebiscites and referendums are often mixed up, but there is a clear difference. The Australian Constitution is a very hard document to change, and the only way that can happen is by having a successful referendum. Voting in a referendum is compulsory, just like an election, and you can either vote yes or no to whatever the question is that's being asked. To be successful, a referendum needs a double majority, meaning that the majority of the Australian population needs to vote yes, but also that the majority of the voters in the majority of the states need to have voted yes. This means that if the majority of Australians vote yes, but three or more states vote no, the referendum isn't successful. It's no wonder referendums have a success rate of less than 20%. But what about plebiscites? They're completely different. Plebiscites aren't about changes to the constitution. Instead, they're like opinion polls that the government runs to get a sense of what the public thinks of an issue. The results aren't binding to the government, but if something is popular, the relevant laws are more likely to be passed. For example, in 1977, there was a plebiscite into what Australia's national song should be, and the most popular response was for the song Advance Australia Fair, which eventually became the current national anthem. Getting back to conscription, there were two votes on this during World War I, in 1916 and 1917. In 1916, Australians were asked whether they were in favour of allowing conscripts to be sent to fight overseas. The majority voted against this. A year later, in 1917, Billy Hughes tried again, and this time an even bigger majority voted against it. The confusing thing is that these two conscription votes are often referred to as referendums. And that's because Parliament at the time called them referendums, for reasons I can't figure out. But they were actually both plebiscites. These weren't votes to change the constitution, because there was nothing in the constitution which was stopping conscription. Instead, these votes were a way for Billy Hughes to see whether there was enough public support for a very controversial issue. And there wasn't. That's right, Hughes failed twice. Do make sure to go and subscribe to Knights in Shining Llama for great domestic Australian political content, but there were three crazy things regarding Australia voting no. Firstly, while on the campaign trail, Hughes had to be restrained by a police sergeant after getting an egg thrown at him. Then, on the second plebiscite, Hughes had promised that if Australia voted no, he'd resign. But when he resigned, he was reinstated on the same day. But number three, and most importantly, was that actually after the first plebiscite, Labor called for an internal vote on Hughes's leadership. When this happened, Hughes led 24 of the 42 members out of Labor to form a new party, Nationalist Labor. But once again, this created three parties, none of which were the majority. So in February of 1917, Hughes committed partisan treason and merged his national labour with Joseph Cook Liberals to become the Nationalist Party. Now this sounds almost identical to Cook and Deacon making the Fusion Party in 1909, but there was one key difference. Hughes had a far greater tenacity than Deacon ever had. Okay, so in 1918, Germany tried one last roll of the dice to win the war with the Ludendorff Offensive, but when this failed by the middle of the year, it was apparent that Germany would lose the war. In June, Hughes was invited to the Imperial War Cabinet to discuss the terms of a peace, however, he stopped by the USA along the way to try and convince President Wilson of the concern of Japan in the Pacific. Wilson was largely unresponsive. And so after his unsuccessful stint in the States, Hughes set sail to the motherland to try and leverage favourable peace conditions for Australia. Unfortunately for Hughes, Asquith was gone and Britain's new Prime Minister, Lloyd George, refused to take Dominion governments into his confidence. Not only that, but Wilson's 14 peace points directly went against Labor's interests as he proposed the removal of all tariffs. Tariffs were seen as a vital strategy to protect Australian industry and prevent companies from using entirely foreign imports. And look, I'm not a big Hughes fan, I think he was pretty reckless at times, but this was the case of the right man being in the right place at the right time. So in fairness to Hughes, he lobbied hard for Australian interests and refused to roll over. While well, resigned to the fact that Japan would occupy German colonies north of the equator, he was adamant that New Guinea and Nauru become Australian colonies. A compromise was reached and New Guinea and Samoa were to be mandated by Australia for 999 years, and Nauru could be co-mandated with Britain and New Zealand. When Wilson asked Hughes whether he would set his 5 million Australians against the Allies' 1.2 billion, Hughes said he represents 60,000 dead. Finally, and very crucially, Australia aligned with America to block Japan's request for a racial equality clause. 
Japan had risen to be the dominant Asian force. It defeated Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, and now at the table of empires, it wanted some respect. However, Australia had the white Australia policy, and Wilson's America had Jim Crow laws in the South, and so Japan's pretty basic request was actually denied. And so Hughes could return to Australia, actually achieving a fair amount. The influence of Japan had been moderated, and Australia had acquired a couple of new colonial possessions. But the home that Hughes was returning to was one that he'd blown up. He'd blown up his own Labor Party, and he'd divided the nation over conscription. Sure, the Great War was over, but the war for Canberra was just beginning. Thanks for watching. You don't want to miss next week as we see the Nationalists take on Labor in the 1919 election with the introduction of a third party, the Country Party, otherwise known today as the Nationals. Don't forget to let me know below if you would have voted yes or no on the conscription plebiscites and consider shouting us a lol on Patreon. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.